As a military analyst, what do you think that the Kremlin's main objectives were with this invasion? Well, I think it was undeniable that the Kremlin's main objective was to, uh, as they put it, militarize and denazify Ukraine. And that implied a blitz seizure of Kiev, probably within the space of a week, overthrowing Zelensky and replacing uh, him with a pro-Kremlin puppet like uh, Viktor Medvedchuk. Well, okay, so let's then get get to the question that everyone's asking. And the reason that I asked that question, Samuel, is because it feels like there was some mixed messaging on the part of the Kremlin at the beginning. At first, they, they recognized Zelensky as the legitimate president of Ukraine, and then Vladimir Putin called on members of the Ukrainian military to, to overthrow them. So I feel like the messaging wasn't necessarily clear. With that in mind, do you see this new focus on Donbass as a real shift in strategy, or do you see it more as a ploy to buy time and regroup? Well, I think that uh, Russia was hedging its bets even from the very beginning. That's very similar to what they did in Syria. I was in Moscow when Russia invaded Syria, and they were always very cautious about uh, making blanket statements about Assad recapturing all the entire territory of the country, and instead focused on defeating uh, counter counterterrorism and uh, defeating ISIS and defeating threats from within there. So Russia's uh, vacillations in terms of rhetoric is not new. With respect to uh, the refocus on Donbass, I am a bit skeptical of it so far. The Russians have continued to launch uh, strikes on Air Force Base in Venezia, which is very close to Kiev, and that's in spite of the fact that the Russians claim that the Air Force and Air Defense and Naval Infrastructure of Ukraine has almost been completely destroyed. We're seeing a continuation of uh, the front in Kharkiv, though the Kiev offensive may have stopped. And there was a statement today from the Russian State Duma speaker, Vyacheslav Velodin, which basically said that Zelensky and his Nazi henchmen should be held to justice, which is implying a much more sweeping regime change. So d doesn't sound like they're they're going to give up on the capital in, in, in any case. Now, even if the Kremlin were to shift its plan and focus more on the Donbass, given what we've seen of their military performance thus far, do you think that they would even be capable of holding that region? What I mean is both politically being able to win over the population or even militarily. Do they have the means to, to hold on to a large region like that? Well, uh, they, they, based on their, their statistics, which are hard to verify, they have 93% control in the hands of the Luhansk People's Republic and around 54% in the hands of the Donetsk People's Republic. And based on how the territories that have been administered by those two separatist militias and now turned Russian-recognized independent states have functioned, it's been a very much a totalitarian system. Like some people have kind of compared it to North Korea inside Europe. So given the degree of centralized control that those militias occupy over their territory and their ability to sustain that control over eight years, it's plausible if they do gain new territory that they will be able to maintain that. Of course, will they be able to take over Mariupol? They offered a surrender over the weekend. Now the Donetsk People's Republic says it'll take a minimum of a week. We don't know whether that will happen. They built an alternative land bridge from Crimea to Donetsk, but without Mariupol, their control over Donbass is a lot more fragile than it looks. So how do you see the perspective, given, given all of the things that you just detailed, how do you see the perspective of, of ceasefire, of peace talks at this point? Well, I think that there is a possibility that we could uh, have uh, peace negotiations coming through. Obviously, abandoning the most maximalist demands, at least in terms of rhetoric, would create more of an open door for discussions uh, with Zelensky and Putin. But Zelensky has insisted that there'll be no compromise, at least to Ukraine, ceding any of its territory. And that may not just include Donetsk and Luhansk, that may not also include Crimea. And given the fact that the Ukrainians are launching a counteroffensive on Kurzon, as they're Ukrainian defense minister's advisor reported today, I think that the military phase of this conflict is still very much alive. All right, uh, Samuel, as many as seven top military, Russian military leaders have been killed in Ukraine. Uh, there have been, most Western officials in any case agree that there's there have been heavy Russian casualties. It's hard to imagine that within the Kremlin there's not some recognition that this isn't going the way that they may have expected. There's been some speculation about Defense Minister Sergei Shogu, for example, who hasn't been, hadn't been seen in any case in public for some time. Do you think that people within the Kremlin will be made to pay for these battles? Battleground failures. Well, I think I think certainly I think that the uh, mission would probably erode the stature of people like Sergei Shoigu and also Valery Gerasimov, which is part of the reason why the two of them have probably been a little bit uh, under the radar lately. But uh, yes, I mean certainly I think that there is room for a recalibration within Russia if there's any truth to the statistics that more uh, more troops have died in Ukraine than died during the entire Soviet war in Afghanistan. But equally, we shouldn't underestimate Russia's uh, potential under Putin for a longer-term attritional war. The Russians carried out two attritional wars in Chechnya before Putin took power, the first one, and the second one while Putin was in power in the 1990s and early 2000s. 
So Russia can commit itself to a long military campaign if it can still keep the public focused on the existential threat narratives that they're pushing, as well as the threat posed by Ukraine as being a hostile state on their borders. And so far, it looks as if the Russian public are at least buying into it or keeping silent about that, and there's no immediate pressure on Putin to change tack or to uh, be overthrown. All right, Samuel.